and welcome to another event hosted by the Language Collaboratory. We're a partnership for the advancement of intercollegiate dialogue on the teaching of languages and cultures, driven by language centers and institutes at the University of Iowa, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, Michigan State University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our aim is to provide collaborative professional development opportunities for educators of language, culture, and literature at the five institutions. Our series this fall addresses perennial issues of accessibility, inclusivity, and learner autonomy and agency through the lens of our current shared circumstances and approaches these issues from a variety of perspectives, building on the expertise of individuals on our own campuses. We aim to share insights and to encourage interinstitutional dialogue, bridging the institutional distance and fostering a collaborative interchange of ideas. You are invited to contribute to what we hope will be a lively discussion. The sessions will be recorded and made available through each institution's website. We ask that you mute your microphone at the outset, that you use the tools in Zoom to contribute questions and comments in the chat, and during the open discussion period to raise your hand virtually prior to activating your microphone. Closed captioning will be available through the live transcript button in the Zoom menu bar. Before we start today's discussion, just a reminder that the next event will be held a week from today at this time hosted by the Language Center at the University of Minnesota on exploring guided and independent learning practices to promote learner autonomy and self-regulation. Today's discussion comes to us from the University of Michigan, uh, from the University of Michigan Language Resource Center, and will be led by Julie Evershed, the director of the center. Julie, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm Julie Evershed, the director of the Language Resource Center at the University of Michigan. And this afternoon, I am very pleased to bring um, to our session uh, my colleague, Dr. Janaya Lasker Ferretti, who's the coordinator of our second year Italian language program, as well as coordinator of Italian internships. She's taught in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures for over five years and has been teaching Italian and Humanities courses for over 15 years. Janaya completed her PhD in Italian Studies at the University of California at Berkeley, where she focused on modern Italian literature and art history. So um, to begin the conversation, um, when we were thinking about learner autonomy and agency, um, this activity that Janaya, you do in your class really was one of the first things that came to my mind. And when you hear gallery walk, um, you typically think of the activity that happens quite a bit in the K-12 language classes, but your implementation is a little bit different. Can you tell us how you implement your gallery walk and what your inspiration was? Yes, of course. And thank you to everybody for coming and uh, for hosting as well. So yes, I originally, I have a, a couple things that uh, inspired me to go this route with my presentations in class. First of all, I, my husband is a physicist and he would always talk about the, the, um, the, the, the conferences he would go to in which he would have to show a poster and then they'd all travel from one poster to the next. And so I found that a very interesting idea that is from the sciences that is not in the humanities. And I actually asked um, uh, Phil Cameron from the LRC to kind of brainstorm with me. And he too is very instrumental in the adaptation of the gallery walks into this setting. Um, so shout out to Phil, of course he's here. <laughs> and um, so what I really like the idea of traveling, things going on at the same time, because I really believe in the dynamic nature of the thing. Whereas if you have a a presentation in a classroom, it's its very, you know, one person is talking and they're all listening. So I really like this dynamism about it. So uh, it it's half about the, the idea of a poster and then half also about this idea from K through 12, as Julie mentioned, um, where they do this in the classroom, but all at the same time. So I like that, but also I was thinking how um, it's not possible to assess that really, right? So, um, in came the idea from Phil about the collaboration rooms that we have at the University of Michigan and how we can, they're small rooms in which we could travel and have them in one kind of corridor hallway and they could move. So it, those are the two things that really got 
us thinking about how we could do it. Um, but K through 12 does use this and theirs is more happening. The idea of having a room really made it so you could assess it, right? Um, because otherwise, if everybody's talking over one another, it's not as uh, manageable. Great. Um, so getting to the um, topic of student autonomy, um, one of the challenges in providing activities that allow for student autonomy is thinking about how much of a framework or scaffolding you should insert into the activity to facilitate meaningful interactions. And can you discuss with us how you handle that balance? Yes, so uh, we, I encourage all my students to come to my office hours uh, at least a week in advance so we can discuss uh, both the presentation and, and the activity. Um, because there are two parts to this. There's the first part where it's a typical five minute presentation. And then there is um, the part where they have to engage with their peers. So in terms of meeting the students where they're at at their level, um, I think in being familiar with the format ahead of time and being aware of how it, the format, how it will flow, um, I think that helps for them, helps them to, to come up with meaningful interactions. And I, we often brainstorm, especially um, how they can uh, make their engagement part, part more um, interactive. So uh, we, we, as a classroom, we introduce the, to to the, the topic of gallery walks, but then as they go through the semester and see different styles and different ways of doing it, it kind of just builds it up. And so they feel also by the end, if they're, you know, we do it four times throughout the semester, they feel sure about how they want to do it or how they want to tackle it themselves. And there are so many different styles that come out of it. Great. And can you tell us, um, talk a little bit more about um, how they decide what they're going to uh, talk about and that, that structure? Sure, yes, of course. So we have, uh, we use the textbook Imagina from Vista. And in the book, there are, little snippets of cultural notes. And it's something that we probably wouldn't actually really address in, a, in class. Uh, and who knows if they would even read it. <laughs> so I like the idea of having a trace, a written trace so that they would have to, they would have an idea about what they're signing up for. So I, I show, I list it actually, if you'd like, I can show you, actually I can share with you later about how I, have the dates and then I have a surplus of, of cultural notes that they can then choose their topic from. So if they don't really know what to choose, they can read them in advance and then decide what they want to do. And I usually have them come up, you know, it's a Google Doc and first come, first serve. Um, but they do, it's a way that I can integrate a part of the textbook that I perhaps normally wouldn't have time for. And then too, once they've done the gallery walks, they can always make reference to these notes, read them again, and kind of deepen their knowledge of the subject if they want. Because again, um, these, uh, the, the, what, what's presented in these gallery walks is then they might find it on an exam. So there needs to be a written trace also of that, of the topic. So um, one of the examples you, mentioned when we were talking about this earlier was um, how students, it was demonstrating how students can really take that topic, but really take it in their own direction. Mm -hmm. And one of the things was, um, examples was a student who selected a city that was mentioned, I think, in the cultural notes, but then it happens to be a city where they don't necessarily speak Italian. And so she, she kind of took it in a different direction um, you want to talk about that example or, or other sure. topics yes. that students have chosen? Sure, I can, I can show you an example actually from her presentation that she just did. But yes, she chose the city of Bolzano where they speak German. And um, she, you know, I always ask them, the first question I ask is, why did you choose this topic? And then from there, I can also kind of gauge, uh, even this morning, I had a student who had a meeting with me and her topic was about how uh, titles in Italian for women don't change if it's, for example, avocado, like lawyer. So from there, it is a very kind of vague topic, but from there, I, she said, I take a lot of STEM classes. I really wanna talk about women in the sciences, right? So I think that it was a way for her to get at something that maybe she 
didn't know she wanted to, to look at, but it's, it's that moment where we can open things up and really tailor it to what they want to present. And in the case of, um, perhaps now is a good time to show a clip, Julie. Sure. So this is from my student who, again, presented on Bolzano. And so for that, she, for her engagement piece with the student, she decided to kind of do a choose your own adventure <laughs> where she presented the students after having presented on Bolzano, what would you like to do? You know, if you were to go to Bolzano, what would you do? So I'm just going to show a, a clip here. Oh, and one second, let me make sure my sound is on. Okay. Mm. Uh, per la mia attività, uh, tu or voi andate a Bozzano e scegliete il vostro viaggio. Oh. So, per prima, <laughs> per prima uh, rimaresti nella città, uh, in Piazza Water o nelle Dolomiti, nelle Alpi? Uh, per me nelle Dolomiti. Anche Perché io. mi piace la vista. Sì. Um, so per numero due, um, cosa faresti? Um, andreste alla Piazza Walter, al Parco Naturale Pues Odle o il Museo di Scienze Naturale? Anch'io. <laughs> so, oh, oh, sorry, one second. Uh oh, it's come. <laughs> per prima uh, rimaresti nella città. Sorry. Uh, in Piazza Water. Ah. Am I back? Sorry. Julie? Oh, You're back. Oops. Okay, sorry about that. It's sorry. That was a little clunky. <laughs> but anyway, well, I like I like her uh, engagement piece there. Um, we had to cut out um, some of the students and we you couldn't see them, but they were there and they were they were for you know, with her asking these questions, they're forced to kind of digest and take in what she's just presented. And I don't know if you can tell if you, you understand Italian, but she's also kind of struggling, um, which I like to see between the two and the voi, um, which this, this particular activity is very good at um, because it really presents the dilemma to them. Like I'm speaking for, to more than one person, right? So they have to use the plural when they're usually used to using two. So she kind of, um, hesitated a bit, but I like seeing her work through that um, in, in this gallery walk setting. And so one of the other interesting things is, um, oh, sorry, it looks oh, like sorry. Kelsey wasn't able to see or hear the video. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did, it, did anybody else hear it? I could see it and hear it. I could see it and hear it. Okay, perhaps we can post it later. Yeah. Um, so one of the other things um, that we talked about is how it's um, really uh, not just the content, but the students while they're doing this are doing this autonomously because you're not in the room with them. And can you talk about that aspect of it? Yes, um, that's what I probably like best about it because I, I just believe I ruined the dynamic. <laughs> Uh, so if this were in person, uh, they would each have a small room with a very large screen and it would all be in the same hallway and I would just be there to keep time. I would knock on their window every five minutes so that they know that they should transition to the engagement piece or I would open the door if it's time for them to travel to the next presentation. Online, I really only create a, a link in blue jeans. This could be done on Zoom as well. 
I record it. It's it's recorded. Uh, it starts automatically without me. And I give them a schedule, which Julie, will you post these or should I show them? I can um, I can just put the links in the chat. OK, so uh, Phil uh, from the LRC has also helped me with a, a, a table that helps. So it's a schedule that they can look at and it's um, a visual table. So they say, OK, from 4.05 to 4.15, I'm seeing this person's presentation. Then I have a minute break and I can travel to the next one. So, uh, so this really helps. Um, wait, uh, remind me again, Julie, where we were. Oh, about the autonomy aspect. Yes. So I, I am not there at all. Uh, they know the schedule and they just uh, follow it. So people come in and kind of come in and out of their presentations. And that's when they also are kind of reminded that they need to move on and, and get to the next presentation. So they're doing these presentations three to four times in an hour. And uh, that's uh, kind of, that's tiring for them, but it also gives them a chance to choose and gives them agency because they get to choose which one they want. But getting back to the autonomy piece, I re they, they do it and they stay in the target language because they're being recorded both in person and also on Zoom or Blue Jeans. So it really, the, the camera or the recording stands in for me. So it's, it keeps them in the target language. And it's also nice because they really have to use these colloquial ways of talking, right? Um, an example that I would, I often hear them say, if they want if they're leaving the room and they want to say, good job, <laughs> they say, buon lavoro, right? But that's actually in Italian, something you say when you start to work, right? So it's a nice teaching moment. And also I provide them with some vocabulary that helps when they're coming in and out of the room. Um, just casual things that you probably wouldn't get in other places like that. You know, oh, you did a good job, or um, I didn't understand. Can you repeat um, stuff like that? So it is. They really do stay in the target language, though, and uh, they know that. You know, I don't watch every. I only watch the one that they tell me to to watch. But flipping through, sometimes I do see other things, and so it, it, I do have a, a clear idea that they're always in the target language. Um, that's great. Can you tell us how the students feel about this activity? What do they think about it? Do they give you feedback on it? Uh, they do. And also, I think, uh, again, Phil from LRC has, has done some formal <laughs> interrogations or uh, he's, he's asked them. And also, uh, when we're in person, he often helps to set up that we would have an iPad in the room. So a lot of them, in, you know, they, they enjoy it. And because this happens in the second year, you know, it's something that they do in 231, for example, the third semester and also the fourth semester. Um, they, I'll, they do say that they have fun and it, they say it creates much less stress <laughs> than having to do a presentation in front of the entire class, which is so nerve wracking for them already in English, let alone in Italian or a, a different language. So all, all feedback has been extremely positive. We have a question here. How would you compare the virtual space this year with the experience physically in the small rooms? Yes, that's a good question, Dan. Thank you. I it translates nicely. It does really translate well. The one thing where I think it where it lacks perhaps something is in the engagement piece. And so in, in the clip that I just showed you, I think that was that was a pretty good engagement piece, but they get really creative if they're in person, <laughs> or they'll also, you know, bring candy. <laughs> One um, student brought cannolis in for everybody. I think it just creates more of a sense of community and because they're engaging with their peers. I do think that part, because now what they wanna do is they wanna do a Kahoot. <laughs> and as much as Kahoot uh, can be nice, it's also very slow. And it's not engaging because unless they're going to play the game show host and say, okay, so why did you answer this, right? It's not, they're just reading off a screen. So I think that's where it takes a hit on the online, in the online format. But other than that, the presentation itself, the, the fact that the students are still talking to each other, 
I don't think that, I think it translates well. It translates well enough, let's say. <laughs> So I know we've got Phil in the audience today, and I know he helps you a lot with logistics. Phil, would you like to unmute and talk about the difference with the um, logistics in person versus online? Yes. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Um, the logistics are, what's the major difference? I suppose the major difference was adapting it to um, between BlueJeans and Zoom is interesting because BlueJeans automatically records it and sends that to instructors. Whereas in Zoom, you have to grant your students permission to record their breakout rooms and then they have to remember to record it and submit it, um, which is a different logistical challenge to, um, to obviously just them having, being able to go into a breakout room and, uh, and just have it be done so that's the and then the other thing that we flipped is um in person uh the student groups will walk around because the presenters are set up in a physical room they've logged into the computer stations etc whereas uh in zoom it's much easier to move one person than it is a group of people successively and so the that logistic sort of flips it on its head is this the right kind of logistics you're thinking of julia Sure. Cool. Um, Sorry, I know I put you on the spot there. No, that's fine. <laughs> I'm happy to talk at length, but I want to make sure that it's it's worthwhile for people to hear. Um, yeah, so if you're doing it in Zoom, the easiest way is to move the individual presenters and then just make sure that you have in the security icon this, uh, everyone can share their screens, right? And then what are some other logistical considerations? If you're having synchronous classes, then you can do it during synchronous class time. But if your class is asynchronous, obviously that's a significant logistical challenge. Um, and then I would, yeah, but we have not had to do anything with that. There's a question from Mia. Mm -hmm. How many students does a student present to in a gallery walk? And how have you and the students themselves noticed any improvement via each presentation? Hmm. Uh, so it depends on the class size. Uh, if you, uh, can I show uh, what Phil has created um, in terms of, let's see here, his little table. I think that shows it really nicely, actually. Um, one second. And tells you also how many students. Okay, so for example, this was something that I did in October. Uh, so there, I have a group of 12, so it's nice and small, but that means that each time there are three presenters and three people in each group and three, three groups. So I create, the, I do this in Blue Jeans. Um, I know that at University of Michigan, Blue Jeans will be a, a retired um, come May 2021. I don't know if it's available at your institution. But this is what it looks like, and I send this to the students. So in this case, there are three. It really depends on the class size. I, in Romance languages, our classes are capped at 18. So it wouldn't be, I don't think I've ever had more than four to five students in a, five would really be stretching it. But I think usually three to four is typical, at least in ours. And was there another part of the question that I, and the answer. And how ha have you noticed um, the students, have you, how have you and the students themselves noticed the improvement via each presentation? Well, in, in terms of one student or like compared to the first presentation of the semester and to the last. I, one thing I want to say is that it's really fun to see how the students work off of each other. So in some cases, it's very clear to see like if they, I was doing a comics course in Italian and they would say, oh, this, this, this uh, style reminds me of this. And so then you would see that the presenter in the next round would tell the other students, hey, doesn't this remind you of this person, right? So they're really working off of one another or even in terms of if it's a vocab word. Um, 
they might not, they might get stuck and then maybe somebody suggests something and then they remember it, right? So they bring it into the next round. Um, so I do think in that way, I see a lot of improvement and just the collaborative nature of that. In terms of comparison between the, the presenters who might present in September compared to those in December, for example, I don't see a huge difference, <laughs> frankly. And I, I, if you look at my rubric, um, that's not really, the point of it isn't really, it's using the language, but I always tell them it's spontaneous conversation <laughs> off the cuff. Nothing should be prepared. Um, I think that's what they're used to doing presentations where they memorize. So it's also kind of nerve wracking for them to just speak off the cuff. And it, in fact, it's a present, it's a poster presentation because on their poster, they can only have 50 words. And it's really meant so that you cannot read <laughs> and that it's supposed to be as making your notes apparent to me and to your fellow peers as kind of a guide. Um, and also, if, if you look at my rubric, which Julie will provide you with, you know, the, the, the most important thing is the engagement piece. It is a research project. And again, it's, it's interpretive skills because they're reading there. It's presentation, the presentational mode. And it's also the interpersonal because they have to talk to each other um, to get through the whole thing. <laughs> well, Dan, do you have a question? I just wanted to just wanted to open this up just a bit um, and <clears throat> wonder if um, people uh, attendees have had experience doing something like this and what their experience is like um, in comparison with with Janaya's. Okay, not online. Um, can, can we ask Kelsey what her experience was? Yeah. So this is pretty typical for us. Um, on the last day of class, instead of doing like a final presentation, we do these small groups, um, unfortunately all in the same room. They're just like in little pods together. Mm -hmm. um, and one person sort of presents at a time. So rather than having one person move around, they're doing it just with, within their small group of usually four or five because we max our classes at 30. Um, mm, so it's, oh, wow. it's really hard for us to assess it. And that's, you know, you can walk around and listen to each person for one minute. <laughs> it's so it's kind of like an easy A project at the end, but mm. um, I, I would like it to be a little bit more, I would like to assess it better. One thing. I, oh, go, go ahead, Joe. No, I was just saying like, that is really how the, the idea of the rooms, which, you know, again, Phil helped me to come up with, um, because the assessment piece, right? I do like the idea of everybody in a room sharing and talking at the same time, but that's not, from an instructor's point of view, it's just not manageable. Um, but it is definitely doable online. <laughs> so if you can, go ahead, Phil. As you, just as uh, to repeat what Janaya was saying, um, the online mode really allows you to assess uh, and take your time and look at the strengths of your students in their presentations. Um, one, because they give you the, they tell you, you only have to watch their strongest presentation, right? They do it three or four times. Um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, and so that helps. And then also if you are, um, because there is a specific presentational part and then um, intercommunication part where they're answering questions and leading a discussion around their topic that can help you sort of shore up um, maybe your quieter students or students that don't get to talk that much uh, in in other situations or during other presentations right which is nice what what's in, intriguing about this too is it seems like these uh, presentations are spaced out over the semester and don't all happen at once correct so that, yes that's a way of managing it um, so you, you have more time. Yes, yes, it's, I, I usually have three to four, you know, every three to four weeks. And um, 
then it's also it, it you have the time to sit and and assess it and rewatch something and what is nice about this too is at least in the way that I do it, I use uh, Gradecraft, which is based, it's a learning management system based on gameful pedagogy. And so it, in this system, uh, I can give them a lot of choice. And so in terms of the presentations, you have they have to do a presentation to be able to pass the class. But <laughs> around that presentation, there are a lot of uh, extra things they can do to get points and work towards the grade that they want. So for example, they can choose to meet, have a, a brainstorming meeting with me at least at, or a week in advance. If they come the day before, I'll give them two points compared to 10. But uh, they can even choose in that week before, what day am I gonna go see her? If, and, and again, if they want to, if they don't want to, they don't get points. And also it's only to their benefit because we simply brainstorm. I give them also links, I send them material. Um, and then after that, after the gallery walk, they have the chance in Gradecraft to do a gallery walk reflection in which they talk about what they learned from their peers and what they would like to remember. Uh, because then it, this material will be on an exam at some point and they will have to talk about what they've seen in certain, they can choose perhaps whose uh, gallery walk they wanna talk about, but they will have to talk about it at some point in the semester on an exam, probably a final one. <laughs> and after that, they also have the choice to debrief with me. And so that too is 10, worth 10 points. And in that case, we can look at the footage together. And it's also a really nice place where I can give them personalized pronunciation help. You know, I'll write in the chat like, oh, how do you pronounce this word? <laughs> um, or I'll, I'll say something that they said, like, what do you think's wrong with this sentence? Like, what, what, what was the, you know, I, especially in terms, it's actually really nice uh, online because <laughs> of the chat feature. Um, and so, I really think there's so many, so many things I can do around the gallery walk. It's in my exams. It's uh, you have a pre-meeting, you have a debriefing and you have reflection. So all of it, it comes like a package deal. Um, I, 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 sorry, I need to interrupt. Um, our time sure. is up um, and there are several questions yet. Uh, oh, sure, if, you, if you folks are willing to stick around, um, uh, and Janaya, if you have a little time, we know we're taking you yes, away sir. from your class right now. No, no, but, they're done um, by now. They're done. Uh, oh, okay. So first of all, I mean, just thank you very much, uh, Janaya, for this for this uh, talk and uh, for talking with us today about this really really interesting um, project that you are, are working on with your students. Thank you. Um, just want to remind everybody here that we'll be sending you a link to. Uh, um, and if, uh, a feed to give us some feedback on today's session and on the series uh, as a whole. And we look forward to seeing you next week um, uh, at the same time. <laughs>